So tonight we've got uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through chapter 2 and verse 3. As I was studying over the last week for this message, I forgot that I had um, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. I was just studying to the end of the chapter, and it wasn't until I think Monday night I re-looked at the schedule, and I thought, well, I've got three additional verses we need to get in. And so that was, I'm glad I wasn't up here tonight and caught cold or added more verses to pastor for next week. But uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through chapter 2, verse 3. The Bible says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you've blessed us with. Thank you for bringing us safely to your house. And Lord, I do pray that you be with those who are not able to be here. But I pray that you bless us tonight. I pray that you bless us with liberty and give us understanding and open our eyes and our mouths to what you would have us say and what you would have us um, see from your word and hear. I pray that you would give us wisdom, help us to be sensitive to your leadership, and that you would help us to learn what you would have us to learn. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. So last week, um, I've... I don't think in James I had a back-to-back, but in First Peter I do, and that was exciting. Um, but last week is where we looked, and we saw in verse 16, where it says, Be holy, for I am holy. And we looked at a lot of commands in our passage last week. That just seems really, really hard. You know, does God really expect me to be obedient to this? And he doesn't just expect us to be obedient, but he empowers us to be able to be obedient to all the commands that he gives us. And so he gives the provision of grace. He gives spirit enablement so that we can be holy as he is holy. And we can be serious about the times. We can be prepared for all things. We can be obedient children to him and live the way that he would have us to live. And we went down through and he reminds us of the blood by which we're bought. And, um, you know, something that you find just laying on the street, you know, you find a can laying on the street, you know, you kick it, you play kick the can, or, you know, whatever you do, but it's not worth much to you. It's, it's just, it's worthless. But he uses the word precious as the blood of Christ, it's the precious blood of Christ. Um, when you go to the store and you get that same can, but it has your favorite drink inside of it, then it becomes precious to you. And it's not just a can, it's a precious can, it's got my drink in it. Um, but all these things that we looked at, and then he continues on some thoughts, and he really gives us the how-to of fulfilling these commands. And we looked at some of that last week, but this passage has been really fun to study. And so in verse 22, it says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. And that first phrase, seeing ye have purified, um, that's in the past tense, or the perfect tense, we would call it, which means it was something that was done once and it's completely finished. And so this, this purifying of our souls, it takes place once and it's finished. I remind you, on the cross when Christ, right as he passed, he said, it is finished. And there on the cross, he did everything that was needed to pay for our sins. And then, of course, when he came out of the grave, he sealed that payment completely. And we... At the moment of salvation, when we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that's when our soul becomes purified. Um, a passage I'll have later in 1 Peter chapter 2, it talks about how he shed his blood to heal us from our sin. And that word heal, it's not just talking about putting a Band-Aid on a skin cut, it's talking about cleansing an inward disease. And so... Um, the Greeks wouldn't have used that word if I scraped my arm and I put a Band-Aid on it. They wouldn't say I healed it. Or they wouldn't even say 
that after it scabbed over and the scab was gone and you couldn't even tell it was there, they wouldn't say it healed. This word, this word would be used for something like leprosy or like cancer, something on the inside that's just long-term constantly growing and growing. And it's a word that just means to cure and to completely cleanse and clean away. And so this happens just at the moment of salvation, and it's a one time and done forever. But in verse 23, we see a similar phrase, being born again. And, you know, we think about seeing you purified and being born again. In regards to what we understand in the scripture, we would almost equate those things. We would find them to be similar. But the phrasing or the, the tense that's used for being born again is the present tense. So it would read, um, be being born again. And so it's something that happens continually. And Peter tells us that we need to keep being born again, keep being born again, keep being born again. When something's born into this world, of course, we know as believers, as studiers of the scripture and understanding of God's world, we know that life begins at conception. It's not when the baby comes out of the womb, life doesn't begin. But that's, um, until we had ultrasound, that's when we could first see the manifestation of the life. Um, but then there's ultrasound, and that's really neat to me that you can see that life um, manifest before it comes out of the womb. But being born again gives the idea of each day, each hour, each minute, each second, that process of receiving the life that God has for us just over and over and over again. And so we have the one-time moment of salvation, our soul is purified, our soul is made clean by the blood of Christ. He washes it in his own blood. But then continually we have the task of be being born again or keep being born again. It's similar to Ephesians 5.18 where Paul says, um, be not drunk with wine when it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That be filled with the Spirit is the same um, tense as this be being born again. So it's keep being filled with the Spirit, keep being born again. Um, I'll read a quote by Roy Hessian from the Calvary Road. And he's talking about, in this book, just the importance of every day, all the time, walking that road to Calvary that we took when we were... Um, when our souls were purified, to use Peter's words, but he says, a new experience of conviction of sin among the saints, a new vision of the cross of Jesus and of redemption, a new willingness on our part for brokenness, repentance, confession, and restitution, a joyful experience of the power of the blood of Jesus to cleanse fully from sin and restore and heal all that our sin has lost and broken, a new entering into the fullness of the Holy Spirit and of his power, to do his own work through his people in a new gathering in of the lost ones to Jesus. And where he shared that quote was when he said when he was struggling spiritually in his life, when he just wasn't having the walk with God that he knew he needed and that he knew he wanted, when he was just kind of lax in his walk, when he wasn't experiencing the power of God and the love of God in his life the way that he wanted to and needed to, he said it's when he realized that he needed to walk that road that he walked when he was saved of conviction of sin, allowing the Holy Spirit to convince him of the righteousness of Christ applied to his account, and then allowing the Holy Spirit to work in his life to carry on the work and what God had for him. And he talks about just that every day of having to find that place, letting the Holy Spirit convict us of sin, taking the time to think, you know, just that word that I thought, just that, um, or anything that I thought, that reaction I had to that person, that's enough to separate me from a holy God. That's enough to send me to hell for an eternity. That's enough to destroy my life and destroy the lives of others. And having that serious look of sin and allowing the Holy Spirit to convict us, and then taking the time to realize but Christ paid for it. Um, I sang that song on Sunday, It's Under the Blood, and we can claim that. And when that conviction comes, um, before, before we're saved and that conviction comes, it's conviction 
toward condemnation as um, the Holy Spirit reveals to us the condemnation and where our soul is headed. But after we get saved, the Bible says that there's no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. And so that conviction that happens after we're saved is not conviction to condemn us, that's conviction to restore us. And that's what Christ wants for us after we're saved, is we see the sin in our life, we take care of it, he restores us. Um, the Bible says, I think it's in John 16, that the Holy Spirit um, would reprove or would show, he would convince the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. And one of the works is the Holy Spirit, and one of his ministry, an aspect of his ministry is when he comes to a believer, when we're feeling convicted over a sin, we're dealing with the guilt of past sins or even present sins, and the Holy Spirit's able to come and at the same time reminding us of the wickedness and the severity of our sin, at the very same time he's able to remind us of the blood Christ shed for us. Now that sin was paid for, it was covered, it's done away with, and as Hezekiah said in Isaiah, God's cast all of our sins behind his back, and he'll remember them no more. And um, if you want to go to John chapter 13, as I was thinking about just this one time having our soul purified, but continually having that experience just relived in our lives, and um, as Roy Hessian said, just that a new experience of conviction and those experiences that take place as we continue to reflect and um, not leave Calvary. There's, there's a very good book. I don't remember now who wrote it, but it's called Lingering at Calvary. And it's, I believe, 21 chapters and just all about things that went on at Calvary. And uh, just a great thought of just the need to linger at Calvary, the need to walk the Calvary road every day and just have those renewed pictures. But in John 13 is where we find Christ in the upper room with his disciples. And this is where the Lord's Supper would take place the first time, and he's getting ready to go to the cross. But beginning in John chapter 13, verse 6, it says, Then cometh he to Simon Peter, this is Christ, after he laid aside his garment, and he girded himself with a towel, and he began to wash the disciples' feet. It says, Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. And as Christ comes to Peter, and Peter says, first, you're not going to wash my feet. Then he says, I need to wash your feet or you don't have part with me. Um, then Peter says, well, then wash all of me. And Jesus said, and considering we're in Israel at this time, um, we have dirt roads, very dusty conditions, kind of a desert place, and open-toed sandals all the time. They didn't have their muck boots they could put on. They didn't have um, tennis shoes. It was just sandals or barefoot. And so you consider walking as much as the disciples did, as much as anybody did, um, walking around their feet and the lower part of the legs, they would have gotten very dirty. And so then you show up to somebody's house and you don't want to track dirt in the house, you know, so you would wash your feet. And that's what Christ is doing here. Um, but, you know, if I, if I take my shower and I'm all clean and I put on my flip-flops and my shorts and my t-shirt and I'm walking around outside cleaning up around the house and I step in a mud puddle, there's no need for me to go back inside and take a whole nother shower. I just, I walk in, I get a wet towel, I wash my foot off where the dirt was and I go on because I'm still clean as a whole, but just through the walking around in the dirt, your feet get a little bit dirty. And the same things happen spiritually for us. Um, you know, walking around in the world daily basis, you go somewhere, you hear these people using this kind of language. You go here and, okay, I gotta turn away, I gotta look this way. Um, that person's really driving me crazy, but I need to walk in the spirit. And all these things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis um, 
our feet get dirty. Our spiritual feet get dirty as we walk around in the world. And Christ is telling Peter, and Peter's telling us, I believe Peter, when he wrote this, might have been thinking back to that day in the upper room. But he's telling us, he says, when these things happen, you don't need to get your whole spiritual bath again. You know, you don't have to get resaved. But you just say, Lord, in a specific sin, you confess that, and it's taken care of, and you're clean. And so he reminds us of the fact that when sin comes into our life, we don't have to get resaved. Uh, that's not what the keep being born again is talking about. He's not saying, you know, every day you got to get resaved, you got to get resaved. But what he is saying is Christ said, if you don't let me wash your feet, you don't have any part with me. And in John 15, Christ said, now you are clean through the word that I have spoken unto you. And so when we consider the word of God, which as we get farther into it, in verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. To keep being born again, as Peter tells us to do, and to have that renewed each and every moment, um, it comes by the word of God. Psalm 119, verse 9 says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Um, and so when Christ says, if you don't let me wash your feet, you have no part with me. When we fail to take the time each day, each moment, to let the word of God sink into our hearts and apply it to our lives, and we have no fellowship with the word of God, which is what he uses to heal us, Psalm 107 tells us, and it's the word of God that reaches to us. And um, Philippians says it's the word of life. And we don't let that life and that word come into our heart, and we don't apply it, we don't spend the time in it. Um, it's hard to have fellowship with God. Because this is, this is Jesus Christ in book form. I mean, he's here on every page, every word is Jesus Christ. And so to say, I can have fellowship with him while still living a carnal life, while still, as verse um, 14 says, fashioning myself according to the former lust. But I can still have fellowship with God. To God, that doesn't add up. If you're going to have part with God, if you're going to have fellowship with God, you've got to let him daily, each moment, be cleansing your feet as you walk in this world. Your soul is saved and sealed by the Holy Spirit, and no man can pluck us out of the Father's hand. But even as we go throughout the world, our feet get dirty, we get defiled. Um, Lot, I think it's in Second Peter, talks about how he was just, but he vexed his righteous soul by the things that he saw and heard. And even those of us who don't choose to move into Sodom and Gomorrah, I mean, I chose to move to Ohio, but... Uh, <laughs> even though we don't choose to move into Sodom and Gomorrah, um, we still see things each day that vex our souls and hinder us, but the Lord knows how to make the way of escape. And he gives us the word of God to help us with those things. That verse that I quoted from Psalm 119, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Um, and then you take verses like... Um, like 2 Timothy 2.22, where it says, Flee also youthful lust. You take a verse like that, and you share that with a young man or a young woman or anybody really struggling with a sin, you say, the Bible says, flee youthful lust. Okay, they, they know it, but if they continue on in their sin, and as they're sinning, they're quoting, flee also youthful lust. That's not taking heed to the word of God. Taking heed is to be obedient to it. And so it's, when we think about the word of God is the way we cleanse our way, the way of God, or the word of God is the way that we straighten our path out. It's not just some miraculous, um, like something we can't, like it, it's common sense, I guess is what I'm trying to say. If, if the Bible says that the way you're going is wrong, the Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, and so if the Bible tells us you're wrong, the Bible's going to tell you how to correct it and do the right. And it makes sense that the Bible would say, if you take heed to my word, your way is going to be cleansed. And it's, you know, if you're struggling with things you take into your body, if you would heed the word of God and you would stop, your way is going to be cleansed. And it's not an abracadabra with a wand, it's just... It will happen. It's a promise of Scripture, and it makes sense if you think about it. Um, if your way is dirty, 
if the path ahead of you is just nothing but a mud puddle, if you stop walking in it, you're not going to get as muddy. And if you turn around and go a different way around it. But seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit and the unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. And so it's in obeying the truth that our soul is purified. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. In John 17, 17, Christ was praying and he said, Sanctify them by thy truth, thy word is truth. And then in John 8, we find the verse that ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free and who the Son sets free is free indeed. And so if you're not going to obey the truth of Scripture, the absolute truth of Scripture, that the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ, the only way to get into the sheepfold is through the door, and Christ said, I am the door, and we try to come up another way. Um, disobedient is punished by God. Disobedience can't win with God. Only obedience to the truth is blessed. And so it's uh, through the Spirit that we obey the truth through the Holy Spirit, drawing us and convicting us in Titus chapter 2, verses 13 through 14 or 11 through 14, it talks about the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously in this present evil world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. And so that grace of God teaches us. Um, and there's, again, a good reminder that grace isn't some inanimate object. Um, abstract objects really don't teach us, but that grace is the Holy Spirit teaching us to deny ungodliness. But he gave himself for us, and it's the Holy Spirit that reveals to us of what Christ did for us on the cross. It's the Holy Spirit that draws us to the Father who begins to convict our heart. And I'm sure those of us who are saved, we remember the times when... Uh, you might have laid your head to go to sleep at night and you couldn't sleep because you were troubled over your sin, you were troubled over your eternal destiny. And that happens so often, and that's the Holy Spirit drawing us through him, and he gives us the ability and the grace and the enablement to obey the truth and to trust Christ as our Savior, and that purifies our soul. But then it says, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, that word unfeigned, um, just means it needs to be genuine. It needs to be um, pure and real. And so one observation that we can find as absolute, absolute truth here is that someone who's truly been regenerated will truly love as God loved. Because in Romans 5, verse 5, it says that the Holy Spirit has shed abroad the love of God in our hearts, which is given unto us. And at the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit moves in, the Bible says that he sheds abroad the love of God in our heart. And of course, there's lost people all over the world. Oh, I love you, I love you. You know, we, that word is so thrown around. But it's not 1 Corinthians 13 love. It's not the greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. It's not the love that says, I'm going to take of my abundance and give to your lack, or I'm going to take of my lack and give to your lack. It's not that kind of love that we see in the world. That kind of love is only what God sheds in our heart by the Holy Spirit. And love is, I believe, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, evidences of God. In 1 John 3, 16, it says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he made a beautiful creation. No, it says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he gave his Son for us. And we ought also to lay down our lives for the brethren. And so, um, if we're going to, since we've been purified, this love of God um, Galatians tells us it's the fruit of the Spirit. The very first fruit of the Spirit is love. And when the Holy Spirit moves in and he begins to produce and do his work, we see that one of the results of that is love and that godly love that says, you first and me last, always. And he says, see that you love one another with a pure heart, fervently. And that fervently is just intensely or earnestly. We ought to have the kind of love for each other as members of this church, as members of the, you know, where, wherever somebody is, if they're a believer in Christ, they're part of the church as a whole. That kind of love, even the love that we ought to have for the lust, 
is that the lust, the lost, is that kind of love that says, I'll take up the heaviest cross, I'll go through the worst pain if it means I can reach you with the gospel. That's the fervent, earnest love. Um, the love that would cause a soul to run to the stake so that someone can see faithfulness to God and God could use that as a testimony and to convict those around them. It's the kind of love that Stephen had when he allowed those people to stone him. And when he used the words that Christ used on the cross, asking God to forgive them and not to lay that sin to their account. It's that kind of love. And then and Saul of Tarsus, who later became Paul, he would have been there. He was holding the coats. And I believe God used that many times in Paul's life as he wrote about um, love and about serving God. But see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. And I believe many of us are probably familiar with 1 Corinthians 13, but I think it could all be summed up in verse 5 where it says, love seeketh not our own. Um, all the other things, and there's so, many, so much time we could spend there, but if we boiled it down, love seeketh not our own. Love says, what do they need? And love, um, you know, people say sometimes that love is blind. Um, in one sense, godly love should be blind. It should be blinded to us of what do I want, what do I want. But we ought to have those blinders up and just those that focus on other people and what they would want. In verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So Peter says if you're going to, um, you know, these commands, be holy, for I am holy. If you're going to have um, joy in tribulation, if you're going to um, believe that it's much more precious than gold that perisheth, if you're going to live your life, we hope you've got to always have this born-again experience going on in your life. And he says it's, that happens by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. I was thinking about the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4. And I think that in reality, any believer could fit in any of those areas in that parable. Um, you know, I think we've all had the times we wake up in the morning, we read a verse, and it just, it really convicts us with something that we've been struggling with. So, you know, I've got this verse, I'm going to take it, I'm going to apply it to my life today. And then you close your Bible when you go to get your cup of coffee, and you pour your cup of coffee, you turn around, the dog runs through, trips you, your hand knocks the coffee cup over, the coffee spills on the counter, you start cleaning it up, and all just the cares of life, the things that need to be done, and before you know it, you're in there and you fall to that temptation, and then a little bit later you're like, but I had that verse. And, you know, I think we fall into that category, the Word of God was sown on the one ground, and they were the ones that accepted it joyfully, but after that, the cares of the world took it away. And I think we've all been there, even as believers, something to apply. But we've also been where the Word of God hits home with us, and we apply it, and it stays deep within us, and we bear fruit, some 100-fold, some 30-fold, some 50-fold. Um, but it's at the Word of God, spending that time each day as much as we can, not just once a day, um, you know, three, four, five, six times a day, as much as we can, meditating on the Word of God. I'm just going over it over and over again in a mind. And then he says, For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass wither, there, and the flower there falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. We think about grass. We're getting into the time of year we don't have to cut it anymore. Um, you know, the grass is going to start turning brown. It's going to start dying. It's, it's going to start to take a different form. It's going to begin to change, but... It says the word of God endureth. That word endureth carries the idea of something that remains the same, can't decay, and it never becomes different than it is. I think about how God's just preserved his word for us. The Bible says it's forever settled in heaven, and we believe that we've got God's pure word in our hands, on our laps, in this pulpit today. We've got that pure word of God that he's preserved for us, and 
it will never change, it will never decay, it will always be the same. Um, if God gave a commandment 2,000 years ago, that commandment remains the same for us today. And we can trust the Lord to help us apply it. But all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man is the flower of grass. You think about a flower, and just the stem of it, if a flower didn't have the actual colorful bud on top, um, we'd run it over with a weed eater. We'd run it over with a mower. But it's just, it's that spark of color at the top that comes out for a time. And that's the glory, and that's what sets it apart from any other um, blade of grass, is that flower on top. I worked for a guy a couple of summers ago, and he said, go cut all the grass in that area and pull the weeds, just don't pull my flowers. And I walked in there, I said, I see no flowers, all I see is weeds, I'm pulling everything out. And so, uh, I guess I did okay, he had me work for him again. But uh, I didn't see much glory in those flowers, but apparently to him they were special. But think about j even just that glory of the flower that sets it apart. There comes a time of year when that flower, that color, it just dies out and it goes away. And it doesn't have that life, it doesn't have that beauty anymore. And all the glory that a man can receive here on earth will one day be like that. It will all vanish away when Christ is glorified the way that he should be. It says, but the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. The gospel comes to us through the word of God. It sinks in deep as a seed when we've broken up our fallow ground and seek the Lord through the power of the Holy Ghost. And that seed is implanted in us. And the Bible says, which liveth and abideth forever. That word abide means to stay continually. And I love these verses as a great reminder that once I've been born again, I'm sealed forever. And there's no chance of me losing my salvation because the Bible says that the seed that, was, that I was born again by is the word of God, and that word liveth and abideth forever, which means where it was placed, it stays. And 1 John 3 says that his seed remaineth in him that he cannot sin, talking about God's seed remaining in me, which 1 Peter says that God's seed is his word, and his word abides forever. And so if that's what I was planted by, if that's where all my abundant and eternal life stems from, that word's not going anywhere. And just another great reminder about our eternal security that we have as believers, the Holy Spirit securing us through his power, no matter what we or anybody else can do. And beginning in chapter 2, we find again that beautiful word, wherefore. It says, keep thinking about these things, but we're going to take it to the next level a little bit. And he says, wherefore, laying aside all malice, Malice is that desire to have harm done to somebody else. It's ill will toward another people. Malice is what God calls it when you're driving down the road and somebody comes speeding past you and cuts you off and you say, I hope you get a ticket. Not because you want justice, just because they made you mad. The Bible says that's malice. Um, it's malice when you have an enemy and they're prospering and you say, I hope they get what's coming to them. Uh, that's the malice. And Christ says, lay that malice aside. Because if I got what was coming to me, I would be in hell today. And I certainly don't want that. And if we would remember where we were headed, and we would remember what God saved us from, we would remember the love God had toward us, and we would love one another with a pure heart fervently, and we would keep being born again each day, having that experience over and over again of coming to God, confessing our sins, repenting and going in the power of the Holy Spirit, we would not want those things to happen to even our worst enemy. We would want them to come to repentance and turn to God and be eternally saved. And then it says, in all guile, guile is just that deceit and that trickery and that um, slyness that we can use so often as Christians. And then in hypocrisies, hypocrisies when you act to be something like you're not, um, you know, that happens so many times, I believe, and, and I'm not saying that, at least for me, and uh, maybe not anybody else here, but I think sometimes our neighbors would be very surprised to find out we were Christians. You know, I think if we would be completely honest over the years, that there would be times where, based on the way we were acting, somebody walked up and said, is your neighbor a Christian? 
absolutely not. He's worse than I am. And I think we would all have times like that. But Peter says, lay aside those hypocrisies. Lay aside hypocrisy is really faking. And he says that we're supposed to have unfeigned love for the brethren. We're supposed to have real love. And he's supposed to lay aside anything in our life that is not real. We're to be open and honest before God, open and honest to one another. And laying aside hypocrisies and envies, um, those desires for what somebody else has and things that you want. And not just, you know, it's okay to be, it's okay to be driving down the road and see a truck. Man, I'd love to have a truck like that. Um, but it's another thing to say, well, um, I want that truck. I want, you know, such and such happened to that person, and I get that truck. Or, um, you know, why does he get that truck and I don't get that truck? You know, why does she get that beautiful thing and I don't get it? Is she that much better than me? And these envyings that we have, then it says, in all evil speakings, the Bible says to speak evil of no man. Um, taking the time, there are times when the truth is just the truth and it comes out. Um, but it's another thing to twist the truth to harm somebody else. Um, Jude talks about great swelling words because they hold men's persons in advantage and admiration. And those great swelling words, um, you know, you crumple up a sponge really small and you drop it in the water and you watch it begin to grow and grow and grow. It's a great swelling. And these words, when we just take the truth, um, you know, somebody says one thing to you and you've got a little bit against them and so you go to somebody else and you say, well, so-and-so, he said this. And you, you blow it out of the water and take it all out of context, but what's that for? It's to make me feel better about myself. It's to make me feel better, um, or me look better to you and put them down in your eyes. And he says we're supposed to lay those evil speakings aside, but also just not evil toward another person. But there are words that we say that God would call evil. There's words we think that God would call evil. And those words that would separate us and put up a wall between us and our fellowship with God, we're supposed to lay those things aside. In verse 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. When a baby is born, it doesn't have to gain an appetite for milk. You don't have to tell a baby, hey, you need to drink your milk so that you can grow. Um, a baby has a natural tendency, a natural desire. God placed in them its instinct. They need milk. They don't, as a newborn babe, you know, just out of the womb, just a couple hours. I don't know how long. You have to wait to feed them. I've got no clue. Um, it might be right away. I don't know. But whenever it happens, whenever you feed the baby the first time, um, you know, you don't have to sit there and, you know, now, now listen, little one. You need to eat your milk so you can get big and strong. Um, God placed that inside when they were conceived, that when they came out of the womb and they were born, they would have that natural desire for the milk. And when we're born again by the word of God, he places us in us that desire for the word of God that we may grow thereby. The pure word of God, um, which, you know, preaching is good, preaching is wonderful, but the Bible evidence for growth. One of the greatest evidences to look at and into a life of a person and say, do I see fruit of repentance? Do I see fruit of God's life in them? Is do they just have a desire just to read the Bible, to study it on their own? Um, you know, keep listening to sermons, keep coming to church, but God says that it's just natural. Just as a baby has a natural tendency for milk, those who are born again by Christ have that natural desire for the Word of God. Um, my sister-in-law, Amanda, when she got saved last April, uh, April of 2020, um, you could not get her away from her Bible, and it was amazing. Um, of course, she would read it. She read it before that, but there was no doubt in my mind. She said, um, when, when she got saved, there was no doubt because I saw a change in her desire for the Word of God. It wasn't just take some notes during the sermon. It wasn't just um, read my Bible because I have to. It was taking extra time, staying up late, studying, um, applying it to our life, 
texting me, texting others, and saying, I really feel the Lord wants me to change this in my life based on what I read here. What are your thoughts on this passage? And to see her life completely turned around, but it was by the word of God, and it was a desire that God placed in her, and nobody had to fake it. No one had to make her just so, so it looks right. It was something, it was a work of God, and when it's a work of God, you have no backsliding. But as newborn babies desire to sincere milk of the word, um, I was saved when I was four. And, you know, when you're a four-year-old kid and you're raised in church, you know, I don't have the past of a meth addict or a, um, someone that smoked weed all the time or drinking problem. I didn't have those things when, when I got saved, but I knew I had sin in my life. I had disobedience to parents, which in God's eyes is a great sin. But there wasn't, for a while from the time I was four to the time I was 14, I struggled a lot with doubting my salvation because it happened when I was so young and there wasn't, you know, people get up and they say, you know, I was the worst drunk there was, but God saved me and I've never had a drink of liquor in 20 years. You just, that powerful testimony of a life change. I didn't have anything like that because as an eight-year-old, I still struggled with disobedience. I still struggled with wanting to go my own way. I didn't have the full understanding of everything, but when I was 14, there was something that happened where I just could not get enough of the Bible. And when I could not get enough of the Bible and I just had to spend more time and I just had to read one more chapter and then one more chapter and one more chapter and I just couldn't get it out of my mind, I couldn't memorize it enough, when that happened is when the big change in my life took place, my outward life, is when the big change of um, a life that looked like a new creation came to be. But it was the word of God that changed it for me. In verse 3, if so be a taste of that, the Lord is gracious. Um, if you've tasted the grace of God, if you've experienced for yourself the grace that came and taught you that Christ came to redeem you from all sin, and that grace that taught you that God loves you, that grace that taught you to come before him in humility and repent of your sin and accept the gift that he paid on Calvary for you and accept his blood to your account, if you've tasted that grace, then you've got that seed of the word of God planted inside of you, and it's waiting to bud. And God's just waiting for us. Maybe, I mean, maybe we haven't been saved. Maybe our soul has never been purified. And we can get that right by the gospel, by the blood that Christ shed for us. But then we've also just got that daily of living in the word of God, letting it dwell in us richly in all wisdom. And getting into the word of God, just having that um, confession, convincing of righteousness, and then carrying on the work of God. And that, that ought to be a cycle we go through a million times a day. Conviction of sin, repentance, convinced of righteousness, and then carrying on the work of God, knowing we've been restored. But there's so many things to lay aside. There's so many things to take on as believers. But the grace of God and the word of God is what's going to do it for us. It's getting into the Word of God and allowing the Holy Spirit to use it to teach us and draw us close to you, or close to Him, um, is what's really going to help us and change it.